Here we go. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, IEEE Buena Ventura Section Computer uh, Society uh, chapter meeting. Um, my name is Darren Johnson. I'm the chapter chair. And uh, a couple of quick announcements before we begin. Um, first off, a couple of coming events. On March 4th, Saturday, March 4th, there's a Girls Make STEM event. It has a variety of STEM uh, workshops for girls, uh, grades five, five through eight. Uh, it's made possible by a grant from TechBridge Girls, and it's uh, organized by uh, IEEE Buena Ventura. The details are on our website, so if you are or know any parents, uh, go ahead and check that out. Uh, another activity is uh, school STEM related is School K. They're seeking judges for an online uh, uh, for a game design competition for uh, all students in grades three through twelve. Yes, there are third graders entering game design competitions. Um, the judging starts this Saturday. Uh, details on that are also on our website. That's organized by uh, the Rio School District. And finally, um, if you are not an IEEE member, uh, there is a deal coming up starting, I believe it's March 1st. You can join for half price, uh, and that gives you membership for the remainder of 2023. The details are on our website. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker tonight. Uh, Dhruv Pandya is an information security professional with an expertise in uh, information security governments, risk management, compliance, instant management, and identity and access management. He currently serves as the Director of Information Security at Wist <coughs> excuse me, Wistia. Wistia is a complete video marketing platform that helps create, host, and measure the impact of their videos. Uh, prior to Wistia, Drev was Senior Manager of Information Security at J.D. Power. He holds a Master's Degree in Computer Science and a, a Bachelor of Engineering in Computer Engineering. Welcome. Thank you, Doran. That was a great introduction and good evening, everyone. Um, happy to be here as usual. IEEE has been uh, very kind, especially the Boina, uh, Boina Ventura chapter for hosting a lot of talks on these subjects, which are sometimes quite underrated, honestly. But uh, I'm excited to present tonight about a regulation which was recently introduced in California. So um, as Toron mentioned, I'm, I'm Dhruv, and uh, I'm currently the Director of Information Security for Vistia, an awesome video marketing platform, so check it out. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to start the presentation. Uh, at any moment, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to uh, put it in a chat or uh, let Darren know, and I think we can uh, have a good conversation. Uh, these presentations tend to get a little bit wordy because they are about regulations. I've tried my best to keep it as interactive as possible, and just let me know if, I, if you have question at any point in time, and I can stop and we can discuss more. With that, uh, a nice IEEE fun fact. So I was recently in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, I was walking on the Massachusetts Ave right by uh, MIT, and I come across this building which had this little plaque. Because if you if you have been to the area where MIT is, it's it's the living history, right? Every building has certain historical fun fact attached to it, or some some invention that was done there. Like I, I saw a building which which hosted the first conveyor bakery uh, machine. Of course, we use it now to prepare cookies in bulk or pizza. But here we have uh, an IEEE milestone building, which is a 211 Mass Avenue, where the World Wind computer was developed and hosted. Uh, so first digital computer used by the US Air Force uh, semi-automatic ground environment, which is the SAGE system. Excellent. This is a gigantic building. Uh, I just was able to take the front view of the picture. So I just wanted to uh, show this. Uh, IEEE does have incredible landmarks like and, and the contribution as well. So pretty much. Uh, just a notice for the presentation, I am in no way a legal expert or a lawyer who have interpreted the law or trying to give you any legal advice. If you really need a legal advice, I highly encourage to go to a privacy attorney or an attorney who specializes in data privacy and following regulations and get an advice for that. 
any citations I've given for the law are pretty much from the California Civil Code 1798, which is the CCPA and the further amendments. With that, uh, we are going to go into some subjects around what is data privacy, common definitions that we might use during the presentation or in the world of data privacy. I will do a little introduction to what California Privacy Rights Act is, what our uh, data categories which are consistently applicable to the California Privacy Rights Act, CCPA, and in a major way, almost all privacy acts, at least in the United States. What exactly was amended to CCPA? And we'll go into it because it's like uh, CCPA is, is kind of a predecessor to CPRA, uh, but it's still a little bit confusing. So we'll go into that as well. What exactly an organization needs to do in order to be compliant with CPRA? We'll go a little bit into the new privacy regulations into the United States, which is Virginia Consumer uh, Data Protection Act, also known as, a, known as VC uh, DPA. And then we have uh, Colorado Privacy Act. And then again, a little bit on how can your org be a little bit more proactive to go forward and do privacy compliance with CPRA. With that, I'm actually going to start uh, with the overview of data privacy. Now, there have been many conversations about data privacy. We all know exactly data privacy. And, and when we talk about a law, suddenly we, we are in the state where we are talking about GDPR because of course GDPR was and is the grandfather of all data privacy regulations. But it, it was in US in 1960 when an academic research was done by Dr. Alan Weston of the Columbia University where he actually defined what data privacy was. And, and that definition has been accepted by almost majority of all the state laws that we see today in the United States. Uh, he wrote, his, his dissertation was converted into a excellent book I recommend, it's called Privacy and Freedom, worth reading. And he sets a definition which says, privacy is a claim of individuals, groups or institutions to determine themselves when, how, and what extent the information about them is communicated to the uh, to others. Now, now the fun fact is, US is one of those countries which like has so many organizations which are into the digital revolution. We see a lot of um, digital transformations, data driven decisions, data driven businesses, advertisement industry is used, social media is used, but the closest the constitution gets to the constitution of the United States gets to the protection or privacy of data for its citizen is via the fourth amendment, which says, and I quote, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against the unreasonable searches and seizures, and that shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by the oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and then persons of the things to be seized. But United States does not give their citizen a constitutional right to privacy or data privacy, I would say. And, and that has to do with a lot of debate, political debate, and we exactly know we live in an era where political conversation can be quite volatile and uh, aggressive. So US doesn't give us a constitutional uh, protection when it comes to data privacy compared to some other countries and regions of this world, which which we are talking about. The European Union has GDPR. India has its own data privacy law. We have Canada have their own data privacy law. We have Singapore. We have even China, uh, who has a data privacy law and one of the strongest uh, in comparison with GDPR. So moving on, we are going to have a quick little exercise, and I think it's it's fun. So uh, this is a this is a little uh, survey or or a poll that I, it just helps to uh, overview of what exactly you would think of data privacy, right? So it's a it's a fun little survey. I would say if you can scan the QR code and uh, log into it, then we we can definitely go go through that survey. And it's completely anonymous, by the way.
let me know if you have any questions or if you have any issues getting into the uh, poll. I'll also put a link in the chat if you want to go directly to the poll as well, if possible. Let's do this. Yeah, yeah th thanks for the link because uh, if you're on your, if you're on a desktop and, and mistyped the code the first time you're guilty here <laughs> yep. no. I, I get in awesome awesome yeah and i think i think uh, yeah just a fun fact i mean i love seagulls that's why you seagulls no particular reasons ah. <laughs> and yeah i think the the response is quite consistent like we we see like 100 percent the response is yes we all want data privacy regulations and we think they are necessary right uh, so awesome. With that mindset, I think I'm going to go into the presentation further. So common definitions, right? What, what exactly are the definitions that one uses in the world of privacy? The first one is personally identifiable information or PII. And simply put, PII is something that can be used to distinguish or trace an identity of an individual. So if you can use the data points and figure out who that person is, that means you have access to the PII. It can be direct data, like uh, name, email address, phone number, or it can be anything that can relate to that person, which means you need you have some other data point combining one anonymous and one known data point to make personally identifiable information. And this definition pretty much defines all the privacy regulations, right? And then PHI. PHI is majorly all the health records, right? Biometric records, health records. And PHI is protected in the United States uh, via HIPAA. So uh, one regulation to be aware of. And then just a little example of what can be considered as PII. So if you have phone numbers, address, personally identifiable numbers, social security, passport, driver's license, your name, email address, and then, of course, technology, uh, assets and information, which is IP or MAC address, combining either or. And, and it's tricky because you, you see a lot of things where uh, IP addresses can be debatable, whether you can link someone to an IP address or not. We have VPNs and there are multiple things. But of course, I mean, privacy regulations do uh, try to hone in into the IP address as well sometimes. Awesome. Moving on, um, what exactly is California Privacy Rights Act? And I'm just going to give you a little timeline, right, on what exactly was happening. Of course, California had the first privacy law or the pioneering privacy law in the country, which was California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA, uh, in 2020. And this law was a landmark because U.S. before that was not into privacy laws, there were a lot of debates, exchanges among experts, but California was the first state to come up with a very stable privacy law and say this is going to be going into effect January 2020. In fast forward, I mean, and of course, like we had a heavy lobbying from major tech companies who were concerned about whether the business cases and the regulations would be impactful or have any any potential impact on their capability to do the business. So there were a lot of exchanges, a lot of updates, a lot of amendments, and it kind of went through till the last year, right? In November 2020, you know, residents of California came up with an initiative and a new Proposition 24 was drafted and put onto ballot because we had a lot of amendments done in CPRA, which was like uh, in CCPA, which was going to be named as CPRA. And then 
there was a certain strategy to kind of create awareness among citizens as well. So then finally, in the in the November 2022, uh, sorry, November 2020, uh, the citizens of California voted and said yes on Proposition 24, and that brought all the amendments, uh, proposed amendments to CCPA, which now we call as California Privacy Rights Act. And, and they're one and the same laws. They were like, they, they were just amended, right? So CCPA is still in existence. CPRA is a term people like to use, but I haven't seen an official reference to CPRA or removing CCPA. So it's kind of still in that same boat, right? And the law still continues. So it, it definitely, I mean, this is an amendment. So there was still continuation from CCPA. It wasn't like CCPA was thrown in the garbage and here we go, we have a new law. So what exactly was changed, right? Major changes, I would say. So officially, uh, CCPA had an officer, which was the attorney general of California, right? And uh, and his office or the office of the attorney general was responsible for implementing CCPA. But with CPRA, they amended and officially made a successor uh, for attorney general or, a, or an agency which would work on keeping up with CPRA for all the organizations in the state and the country uh, called California Privacy Protection Agency, the CPPA. And Bear with me, the, the acronyms are quite confusing. So, uh, and it's gonna get worse, but <laughs> here we go. And and CCPA, uh, CP, CPPA is a regulatory authority. So it can also enforce and uh, regulate all the um, amendments for CPRA. And then ultimate authority still stays with the attorney general. And the reason for that is it, it's a law. So it goes to their office. Uh, the fines are quite consistent with CCPA, so 2500 per violation, 7500 per intentional violation, so here per is per record, so 2500 per violation, 7500 per intentional violation, and 7500 per violation if involving children under age of 16, and then of course private right to action. So after all of that, a citizen can choose to uh, take legal action on a, a company. Uh, who needs to comply, right? With CPRA, again, it's pretty consistent with what CCPA had, except one change. So an enterprise that does business in the state of California, so if you are doing this business in the state of California and you have revenue over, like, let's say $25 million in a calendar year, or you sell or share personal information of 100,000 consumers or households in an year. And, and keep in mind of uh, the definition around consumer and households because uh, CCPA and CPRA both tend to jump back and forth into combining the definition for PII. And CCPA had like 50,000 uh, personal information. So it was a minimum 50,000. And so it was a little bit relaxed in CPRA and amended to 100,000. And then derive, or if your company derives 50% or more of its revenue from selling or sharing uh, consumer personal information. Uh, what data categories are covered under CPRA? So CPRA, again, like CCPA, uh, again, can identify any, any data that can identify a person or uh, data that is linked to a household or that person. Of course, like some out, some right out of the bat, we have SSN, na email, name, address, that kind of PII, which will be covered under CPRA. Uh, also, the biggest change in CPRA as far as data goes was if you are an employee. So before in CCPA, employers were not liable for the information of an employee, which means if should something happen to the information of an employee who lives in California, it, it was not covered under the law. CPRA changes that and any data that is specific to an individual employee who lives in the state of California and consider personal information, uh, an employee has to give the same level of protection to that information. So it's, it's pretty interesting on how this will turn out into the market. And then, of course, if an organization is attempting to collect the information from an employee under this rights, then they have to give the notice and the same level of detail that one would offer to its customer. 
the data that is not covered under the CPRA law, right? So medical information is not uh, covered under CPRA. Uh, the FCRA information is not covered under uh, CPRA. The information covered under the financial or the GLBA is not covered under CPRA. Uh, surprisingly, the data minted by vehicle dealerships or manufacturers for warranty and recall support is also not covered under CPRA. Uh, data processed under the Drivers Privacy Protection Act is not covered under CPRA. And then data may be retained in some cases by for valid exemptions provided by the law. And then employees and business partners data is not exempt. So we discussed about it in the last slide. Uh, if you have an employee from California, you will have to preserve the data in a similar capacity as you do for your consumers. And of course, the government and nonprofits are exempt from this law to my knowledge. Um, and I wanted to bring this slide because it's important to understand what CCPA was, because CCPA is, it's people are referring to it as the predecessor for CPRA. I don't think so. Like there are minor changes to that law, but again, the law is quite consistent. We, come, we came a little bit closer to GDPR. And CCPA was again, first of its kind, launched in 2020. And then consumers and personal information uh, definitions were for the first time made pretty clear in a, in a regulation. And then again, like if you look at the definition of what we discussed is applicable in CPRA is exactly the same in CCPA, right? And consumer definition of what a consumer is, is quite consistent. This is fun. So I, I wanted to, make it clear on exactly where we stand and, and proving my point on why it's not exactly a predecessor, right? It's a similar law. So right to access the data. A, a consumer or a citizen of California has a right to access the data. CCPA says so, CPRA gives you the right to, right? Rights to correct the data. Now that was a change and I think that's pretty much taken by book from GDPR. So nothing wrong in it. But uh, if you see CCPA doesn't give, the, give you the right to correct. So now you can go to a company and say, I want my data to be corrected, right? And the company has to correct the data. Of course, there is still work going on on how exactly one designs like a data service request. Uh, but it's, it's a right now through CPRA rights to object opt out if you don't want to participate in a company do not want to give your data to the company you can absolutely opt out of the uh, uh, participation and say no longer in that particular program and then rights to limit the use so ccpa never defined what exactly were the rights to limit the use cpra actually gives you the right to tell the company you shall not use my data for x which is phenomenal, right? Now we are one step even closer to GDPR. Uh, rights to delete the data. Both CCPA and CPRA gives you the right to ask the organization to delete the data. Uh, right to non-discrimination or retaliation. CCPA and CPRA both gives you the rights to uh, non-discrimination. So if a company would retaliate, you absolutely have a right to legal action. And then private right to action, which is limited because private right, and of course, given both by CCP and CPRA, but the way you take the private action is kind of limited to the circumstances and the data violation. So uh, intentional violation versus non-intentional violation. So there are a lot of factors that has to be considered. Of course, it's a matter for an attorney to give you an exact detail of how it, uh, how it comes into action. Uh, the requirements for CPRA compliance, right? So how exactly we make sure that we are compliant with CPRA? And it's quite consistent with CCPA, but with a little bit of variation. And I'll, I'll get into it where you see a variation. So one of the things which is very important in CPRA and CCPA is that you need to make good enough disclosures on your websites on how exactly is the data collected, right? And disclosures are sometimes confusing, but the emphasis has been given on layman's terms, like your policy and dis data disclosure should not be confusing. It should be simple enough for a citizen to understand and talk about it, right? So disclosures are required and the type of disclosures are, what type of data are we going to collect, right? So company need to be very consistent 
concise and transparent about what type of data they're going to collect from the users and of them, which are the residents or citizens of the state of California. What is the purpose of the processing, right? So why do they need to collect that particular type of data? Because it's pretty important, right? We know exactly what they're going to use our data for. So it's not just about giving the data, but how are they going to use the data? And then intended re retention periods, right? Which means the retention period is defined in CCPA. There were there were a couple of mentions about how much the data should be retained, but CPRA kind of wants you to disclose it to the users on exactly how much do you intend to retain the data. So in some business, and of course, data retention and data governance is subject to business requirements, right? So some businesses might require that data to be there for 10 years, five years, seven years, but the point is you need to let the users know that after 10 years, data is gone. Make it pretty simple. And then, of course, while the data is with you, you have to secure, right? You have to secure, you have to maintain the data. And of, of course, during those retention periods, you can of put in requests to see if, what data is there with the company as well. And then if they are, if the organization is going to sell your data or share your data with any third party, that has to be made crystal clear because there are requirements related to third parties, vendor management. And of course, like if the data is being sold, there are, there are specific requirements that an organization has to comply with. And if there are any financial incentives related to the data collection. So these are like very nice requirements. Um, quite a upgrade from what CCPA had in terms of um, how the dis, uh, disclosure should be. Moving on, data subject rights. So we talked about what a company has to disclose to a user, right? Now, as a user or as a resident of California, you also have rights around how the data is being handled, right? So again, standard rights, right? To access, correction, deletion. The company cannot retaliate against you or an organization cannot retaliate against you just because you asked for your standard rights. You can also write, you have also have a right to opt out of sales and sharing. You also have the right to restrict the use of sensitive information. You can go ahead and say, do not use my uh, information for certain purposes. And then, of course, the right to opt out of automated decision making. This this kind of is impactful too, and it's a, it's unique to CC, CPRA because it kind of talks uh, and has an impact to advertisement industry, right? So Facebook and other digital advertisement platforms might use data for automated decision making, giving you perspectives, right, on the analyzed data or data-driven decisions online. And of course, coming with AI and every new technology that is going to come in the market, uh, it would be interesting to see exactly how these rights are upholded or what exactly are the litigations, which gives us a clear idea of how they were practiced. And then uh, we have data sharing, data sharing, right? So a company has to be consistent in terms of cross context behavioral advertising, which means if, if you are going to have multiple platforms use your data as an organization and do uh, cross context behavioral advertising like Facebook does, then you definitely need to disclose it and certainly give the data, uh, you know, the residents, the right to the data. Moving forward, uh, there's also a requirement for the organizations to have privacy principles in grade uh, ingrained in their processes and like have a robust privacy policy where uh, the design of any system or any any application that uses data is designed with the data principle of design uh, data minimization right so you don't want to go in and say oh that looks cool we might add one more data point which is completely opposite to what you decided when you were designing a system. So CPRA gives you a clear instructions that stay close to how you designed the system or the reason you mentioned on the website. Otherwise, there will be implications on ap applying more and more regulatory requirements, which can have negative impact or potential lawsuits for a company. And then necessity and proportionality. Of course, I mean, when we talk about data privacy laws, data privacy 
every law tends around the same thing, right? If you don't need it, don't collect it. You don't want the people data, right? You don't want PII on your servers. But we do live in a world of data, right? Data is a commodity more expensive than oil. We cannot survive this world without data analysis. So it's always a good thing to remind organizations of why is it necessary and why is it important to have data necessity and proportionality and, and the minimization of data collection, right? And then storage limitation. So you cannot say I'm going to store this data forever, right? This kind of goes hand in hand with the data retention requirement. You have to let people know how you, how much storage you're going to have, right? How, many, how much data you're going to store. Uh, and then of course, litigation requires you to be absolutely transparent with the agencies that you report to as well. Moving on, uh, there are significant requirements for classification of vendors. So vendors are, again, it's in the same category. I think a little bit change in how we look at it now from a CPRA perspective, where we kind of bulk like service provider and contractors together. It's pretty close to GDPR again. You see these languages are referred into GDPR again and again. And sub processor or a contractor can be someone who is uh, working on the data on behalf of your organization, or you share the data with that particular sub provider uh, to to work on a project to have some uh, some more analysis done, right? And and there are a lot of these third party agencies that kind of work on it. Uh, the definition of contractor is quite a loose. It's not super strong, but I think it falls into the same service provider categories. And then the third parties are categorized as data sharing requirements. And uh, like you, you just are supposed to give like a data sharing and disclosure requirements to the third parties. And third parties can be almost anyone in this, in this case. Uh, moving on, compliance requirements. So now you have to explicitly add CPRA requirements in your contracts, your MSAs for your data processing addendums, right? If they're part of your contractual process where you have to specify in the, in the contractual document on what information is sold, disclosed, or is just used for specific purposes, right? You have to obligate your third party or the contracting party to comply with CPRA and provide the same privacy protection that is required by CPRA for you. So great addition. I think it matches up a high standard. Uh, it also requires a business to let you know if they are no longer compliant with CPRA, right? And then it does make, it does gives you the rights to make reasonable and appropriate steps if you figure out that someone is not consistently uh, compliant with CPRA, right? And then all the third parties, sub processors and contractors must stay, must accept and, and, and consent that they understand the restriction implied by CPRA. So fun enough. And then lastly, there are some, some miscellaneous requirement and, and it, it's tricky because I call them miscellaneous requirements considering what we just saw as primary requirements. But miscellaneous requirements are not really miscellaneous. It's a huge undertaking, if I'm not wrong. So the CPPA or the, the protection agency, right, which was authorized by the attorney general, is still working on what exactly is an annual security assessment, right? What are the standards for an annual security assessment? There's a requirement for having an annual security assessment done by any company who falls under CPRA. Any company who falls under CPRA is supposed to do an annual risk assessment, right? But there's no clear definition on exactly what requirements are there, how are they going to do it, what is the evaluation period, gaps, what do you do, that kind of stuff, right? So it's like you have to do this and submit it to the CPPA, but there are still ambiguity into what we, what we are going to do as of today. And then when we talk about annual risk assessment is mostly alluding to a privacy impact assessment. They're not really interested in learning about your organizational risk, but they're more interested in learning exactly how risky your organization is as far as the privacy of the customer or um, resident is 
concern. And then provide privacy training for all employees, which includes CPRA, HIPAA, again, definitions of PII, you gotta give it to your employees as well. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna take a minor break to see if you have any questions before I move forward. Uh, if anybody has, oh, there we go. Uh, Drew, if you can see the uh, chat, I assume. Uh, yes, I can see the chat. Okay. So it's a question from uh, Mr. N. Baker. Um, how does the current state of CCPA compare to the GDPR overall? What areas of GDPR are tighter relative to California? Conversely, are these areas that California's rules are more restrictive than uh, GDPR? No. So, okay, excellent question. So the, the current state of CCPA is, is quite as close as we can say uh, to GDPR, right? So GDPR is definitely the grandfather of all privacy laws because if I go back to the slides and give you an example why. So let's go here. Who needs to comply, right? So now California has made this consistent definition of who needs to comply, right? If you look at GDPR, it's simple. If you if you have access to an data of an EU uh, resident, you're part of GDPR. And of course, as all regulations do, there are loopholes somewhere, but it's way stricter than what California considers the definition of who needs to comply, right? But it is certainly tighter now. If you if you would have asked me the question earlier, like in 2019 when I was presenting uh, for CCPA, I gave an, an example of uh, if you have seen The Lord of the Rings or any movie where you have a bunch of army coming towards the enemy and suddenly the land goes underneath them. That's what I call it. The army was supposed to be GDPR and our CCPA, but it's completely baseless. It's not nearly as as tight as GDPR was, but with CPRA and the, the amendment to CCPA, it's very close to GDPR. And then, uh, no, there is, uh, there are there are no more restrictive guidelines in GDPR, uh, in C CPRA, which are not in GDPR. So of course, GDPR still holds the highest standards in the market. I hope I answered your question. Thanks, Drew. I, I I have a, a question too uh, regarding um, the slide you had on about data categories and under uh, exemptions. There was like you know you had bullet points for HIPAA and so forth. Yeah, then the uh, valid exemptions provided by the law is that <laughs> so uh, regulators always love put it, put in like catchalls like that, don't they? Of course, and I think that's why that's why it's like there's a difference between a, a regulation developed by uh, a lawyer versus a security policy written by a CISO, <laughs> and uh, th there's a difference, right? And and of course, there's a lot of lobbying attempts going on too. So laws have to have some loopholes. So you good to catch that, yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Nick, my pleasure. Thank you for asking that question. Okay, let's move on to the next interesting subject. So, you know, CPRA was not the only showstopper during this year. Uh, we had an important uh, regulation from equally important state, Virginia. So when Virginia launched Consumer Data Protection Act, the VCPDA, uh, and... Uh, it was uh, interestingly launched at the same time CPRA was in effect. So ja starting January 1st, 2023, we have to comply with Virginia Consumer Data Protection Act. Now, what the, the, the law is pretty consistent with what CCPA says. So of course, Virginia looked up to GDPR and CCPA and said, how can we leverage the same thing and create our own law, right? So it, it gives you additional privacy rights to any resident of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And if you see the rights are pretty consistent. So right to confirmation of personal data processing, access the personal data, correct inaccuracies. So 
now you see like you know california took like what three years to come up with right to correct inaccuracies in your personal data for an organization we see vcpda has this from day one which is pretty awesome um, right to delete personal data right not to be discriminated and this is interesting so right to opt in a copy of personal data for purpose of targeting advertisement sale of data profiling decisions so you can actually request a, a copy of your personal data from an organization which i think is a gray area in cpa ccpa uh, definitions of who does the law apply to or who should be complying with it? And if you see, it's pretty consistent, right? With CCPA or GDPR, uh, where we say VCPDA applies to the person who conducts business or produces or products or services that are targeted to the residents of Virginia. Uh, the, the statute doesn't define what targeted means, right? So, I mean, of course, again, there is a loophole that has to be put in, but hopefully they, they put an amendment and correct that. And no nothing against it, because usually the first draft of the laws do tend to have certain misses. Uh, the Virginia residents aren't able to directly sue over the violation. So this is the difference, right? Enforcement is left in the hands of the state attorney. So you don't have the right to action. Uh, you can seek damages up to 7,500 per violation, but that's something you have to go through the state attorney. You cannot go to the organization and sue them. There's a plus business. Uh, the, the business in law has like 30-day QR period, which allows the companies to receive letters alleging non-compliance. So let's say if you are not compliant with VC, uh, VCPDA, then there is a 30-day QR period for you. And then unlike CCPA, Virginia data privacy law explicitly allows business to offer different price, prices and levels of services to consumers enrolled in the loyalty programs without having to comply with certain regulations. So uh, that one's that one's interesting too. Like they made it a little bit more business friendly uh, versus what CCP has currently. And I think they will they will come to that realization probably in the next two to three years, hopefully, and and change that part. Uh, a little comparison with what uh, CCPA, what, the difference between the VCDPA and the CCPA. And I realized it completely messed up on the abbreviation. So uh, going back to the point around abbreviations they're the worst <laughs> and uh, uh, vcdpa is just like eight pages way more concise uh, defined and nicely uh, persistent to what data privacy law should be other than california consumer privacy act which you can spend hours and days interpreting and reading is <laughs> a nice book and then vcdpa defines whose personal data is covered describing consumers as Virginia residents and acting only in an individual household or context, right? So if you are a Virginia resident, then that's it. That, that, that brings you under this particular law, right? And that gives you a lot, nice insight into a law being a little bit mature than what an original CCPA law was back in 2018, right? But with that also like, ooh, Additionally, businesses also have to like um, like satisfy the threshold. It's like uh, hundred thousand records, hundred thousand customer records, or like you you have uh, certain uh, certain upkeep with the revenue and that kind of stuff. Virginia law doesn't have any significant record keeping requirements, like how data retention and storage requirements are in CPRA. Virginia law doesn't require you to do that, aside from protecting your assets, and that's quite common sense, right? You don't have to explicitly call it out, but could they call it out because uh, if it's a law, then you have to do it. And then it, it's designed in such a way that if you are compliant to GDPR or CCPA, then your organization is automatically ready to be compliant with Virginia residence uh, law with just a little bit of changes here or there. Uh, another interesting law that is going to come in the year starting July, 20, July 1st, 2023 is the Colorado Privacy Act or CPA. Uh, again, abbreviations, they're the first, but here we have one. And then it, it clearly defines who a Colorado resident is. Uh, and then uh, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable definition of what an identifiable individual data is versus like a quite comprehensive definition around CCPA on what uh, PII can be, right? 
And then CPA excludes the de-identified data and publicly available data. So if the data is already available publicly or an ident or data is identified online, then good luck, then that's not covered under CPA. And I think that will be changed as they move forward, but hey, that's a start. And then CPA applies to every entity that conducts business in Colorado and produces, delivers commercial products, right? And then this is quite consistent to both CCPA and uh, the Virginia Data Privacy Act, which is um, if you have the personal data of at least 100,000 consumers or personal data of at least 25,000 consumers while deriving revenue or receiving discount from the sale of that data. So no, no minimum revenue requirement, but the threshold of a consumer data quite consistent with quite consistent with the Virginia law, right? And for the purposes of enforcement, um, it, it it goes to the attorney general or district attorney, depending upon where the violation is, compared to a state based authority where it's just the uh, attorney general. So these are the two laws which I think you should keep an eye out on twenty in twenty twenty three. Of course, I mean. Um, the Virginia and the California laws are in, in impact right now. It's it's ongoing, but uh, Colorado Privacy Act as well. Well, it's a, it's a great law to keep an eye out on for. And then what exactly you should be doing as an organization, right? So if you have an organization which kind of falls under any of these categories, then I highly recommend to start reviewing your privacy policy. Hopefully you have a privacy policy on your website because as I mentioned earlier, Disclosure is quite important and concise disclosure of how, what, and how how will you collect the data, what type of data you collect, how will you protect the data, how will you store the data, what is the retention standard. It's going to be quite important to disclose these things to the consumers and then ensure that you, you do assert on your website if you are compliant with CPRA, that you are compliant with CPRA, and then as I said, right, any any specific disclosure of rights that you want to convey to your uh, consumer. Then, of course, the rights of the data subjects itself. So if someone wants to send you a request to all the data subjects rights we discussed to, to access the information, correct the information, delete the information, you need to have facilities for them to be accessible. You have to be accessible enough to, to give them or give them an opportunity to exercise their right and then implement those functions internally as well right and then you can you can set up like a form you can set up like a helpline number multiple ways to do it and then are you really ready to handle the volume because once this becomes public right like gdpr it's it's going to be phenomenal people will try to exercise the right so as an organization are you ready to handle the volume is a big big question and then uh, again, as we move forward, right, data governance becomes a big thing in an organization. So uh, however small or big, I think one should have a handle of what type of data they are collecting, uh, what type of data is being shared or sold if you're doing that, and then classify that data, identify where that data is, put appropriate security measures, right? Who are the primary data handlers in your organization? Or if you have a subcontractor, all of this information is going to be pretty important because let's say if somebody puts a request in and if you have no handle on what exactly the data is being handled for or what exactly is the data being collected for or where the data is, it's going to be a serious problem. And, and the negligence, the fines for the negligence are, are 7,500 and then private right to action. So you don't want to put yourself in a position where state laws can completely um, annihilate the whole profit that you might be making in the market. And subcontractors and third-party vendors in the security world, I think it's it's always, always a nervous position when third parties are mentioned. Over the last few years, we have seen serious damages via uh, managed partners, third parties uh, that have access to your platforms, access to your data being hacked, and subsequently, uh, someone else being and somebody else impacted, you do it. So make sure you have equally good data governance over your vendors as well. Try to enforce them contractually, right? We don't need to make that uh, 
and and uh, verbal thing and and it's it's very important to involve your security um, staff in that as well and then address vendor contracts super important right so as i said cpra requires you to exclusively mention uh, the re requirements in the contract or any contractual documents and then make sure that all the contractors are equally compliant with cpra as your as your own company is so that's pretty much from my side i think i'm going to uh, do one more slido for you guys so i i just uh, uh, stay tuned i think it's the same link if you want to use it or i can put one more link again in the uh, chat so you can access it i think it's a it's a nice fun exercise based on what we just saw so link is in the chat and yes i do love cats like the seagulls awesome we have two responses so far and it's a, it's a question that bugged me while i was creating this presentation the entire time because as much as i'm excited as a resident of all the rights that has been awarded to me um, it makes it quite complicated for the businesses to go to these different regulations comply with these different regulations and you know it's it's important that we make it business friendly in this country too because ultimately that's what holds up our economy uh, certainly while giving the similar rights and provisions in a in a law in a federal law but uh, excellent we have three responses and of course it's 100% uh, which is awesome awesome with that i think i will conclude my presentation uh, i'm again open for any questions that you might have any conversations that you might want to have yeah. everyone you can either uh, type your questions into the chat or uh, you should be able to unmute as well and uh, i'll i'll throw out i'll throw out one um so a lot of websites over the past couple of years i've seen um if you're registering for something it's like oh and if you're a california resident click on this extra thing and read this extra addendum presumably we're going to see um if you're in colorado click here if you're in virginia click here if you're in and as other states uh, adopt stuff it's going to get uh it's going to get a little wild right and they they have to right like if you if yeah. you go to some of the privacy policies of uh, some of the companies that i've seen right now they have before it used to be you have separate privacy policies mentions or or like little addendums or uh, supplements for different countries right because if you are a multinational company you have to do that but now it's like it's not just that it's now you have supplements for each states from your general privacy policies which is like quite a bit of overhead right if i if i must say so let's say if we have a company with like 50 people or 100 people uh, managing a lot of stuff like keeping up with these regulations become expensive you need to have a legal opinion on everything make sure you are compliant but at the same time there there are both plus and minuses on the on the benefit side right so i think we'll see more and more of that but i i do believe like it's about time the us government acts as a central agency for managing privacy because we can certainly take certain good we can certainly take some uh, examples on the gdpr side uh, and that's definitely my opinion i mean um, of course people might disagree on having a federal law because there can be many implications and and the way federal government uses that particular privacy law all right thanks um so any other questions like i say either uh either type or uh or you should be able to unmute if you want to say your question out loud I'm going to take it that's a no, unless somebody is frantically typing right at the moment. All right. 
Well, um, well, thank you so much, Drew. That that was really a really interesting talk, and uh, I think that to people who are involved in uh, information privacy are going to be really busy over the next few years. I do believe that, yeah, and I think uh, it's it's interesting how privacy is now important. At the same time, it's quite complicated because emphasis has always been given in the security industry to like make your pro uh, make your policies in layman's terms, right? Everyone should understand it. Shouldn't be a jargon of legal stuff. But at the same time, the regulations itself are jargons of legal definitions, which makes it very difficult for people to kind of interpret it and you have to have a legal opinion. So yeah, I completely understand. But thank you for the opportunity. And uh, you know, this is an excellent, uh, excellent audience. I think I, I, I really enjoyed presenting for you guys. So I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Well, well, thanks again. And thanks, everybody, for joining. And uh, we will be posting this, uh, a recording of this uh, in the next uh, day or two. So uh, thanks a lot and take care. Yeah. And uh, just one comment to Nick. I think you reached out to me. Um, definitely uh, uh, look, search for me on uh, LinkedIn and we can connect if you need any more information as well. So. I'm happy to help you. I, I believe the uh, the meeting announcement as well had a had a um, a link to your uh, or web, your website. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Right. Yeah. I'm always open to uh, connecting and uh, you know uh, sharing the more information. That's how we develop a community for these things. All right, thank you. Thanks, thanks again. Take care.